Okay, good morning. Good morning, church. How are we doing today? Yeah, great, great. I'm excited to be here today. Uh, if For those of you that don't know, my wife is, you know, 10 months pregnant right now. And every, every morning that we're here, it's a blessing. We're really excited about it. And um, yeah, it's just a real, it's a huge pleasure of mine to be here because Sunday is one of my favorite days of the week because this is the day that I get to hang out with you guys and the day that I get to, yeah, just do what I feel like God has really called us to do. So I'm really advocating that Casey gives birth on a Tuesday because Monday is my Sabbath. So I want to be able to obviously sleep in and get plenty of rest on that day. So you guys can be praying that she, she holds it in until, until Tuesday, right? Uh, fantastic, fantastic. I, I really like what Emma said before we get into the message, what Emma said about you know being a church of prayer. And in fact, we've got a guy on staff and his name is Brandon. And Brandon's our hospitality manager. And then he also just helps us with about a million things during the week, including our events. And Brandon's mom, uh, who is in, I think, the Congo, but she is very, very sick. And he's not been able to get to her. And uh, she's been in and out of the hospital and we love Brandon and we care about him. And so I just want to, as a church, say a prayer for, for Brandon and for his mom. And so let's just pause and do that. Heavenly Father, as an entire church, we come to you and we just lift up Brandon to you and we lift up his mom. We pray, Father, that you bring peace to their family and bring peace to Brandon as he is so, so, so many kilometers away from his mom and uh, we pray, Lord, that you would make a way for him to be able to get to her. And we also pray that, that you would just revive her and bring her out of, out of the situation that she's in in the hospital and that her health would improve. And Jesus, as an entire church, we put our faith and trust in you and we are expectant to see the miracle that you're going to do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you for that, church. Thank you so much. It's great to be a, uh, it's great to be a praying church. Um, so... We've got a, a series that we're doing over the next couple weeks, and, and this is a lead up to Easter Sunday. I'm very excited about Easter Sunday because I'm 99% sure that the baby's going to come before that, and we're going to be able to be here for Easter. So over the next two weeks, we're looking at, at the bad boys of Easter. See, when we look at the Bible, when we look at the Easter story, we see Jesus, and we see the story of Jesus, and we, we learn from it. I mean, that's the thing that we study, that's the thing that we know, that we associate with Easter coming up in a couple weeks. But actually, there's all these characters that are in the, the peripheral around Jesus. That there's people that are a part of his story and a part of the story of him moving to the cross there's, there's these people that had a role to play that we don't talk about that often because there's not a lot said about them. But actually, there's a lot that we can learn from them and a lot that we can learn about them. And so that's what we're going to do this week and next week. And I think it's going to set us up really well for Easter Sunday and even for Good Friday service on Friday. So the, the, the thing that we're going to talk about today, this is going to be almost more of a narrative that I want to bring you guys on. And there's a word that I want you to put in the back of your mind as we listen to this narrative, as this narrative begins to unfold as we go today. And that, that word is resistance. So resistance is a word that we all know. We watch our three-year-old resist everything that we do. We watch our husbands and our spouses resist the good advice that we give. Um, we can be resistant to cold water. I don't know, for those of you that swim, you know, it's, 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 it's making that step of jumping into the pool or jumping into that cold water. There's all these kinds of, of resistance that we do. And so I thought, let me put the definition on the screen for you. And so as a noun, it's the refusal to accept or comply with something. All right? And so an example is they displayed a narrow-minded resistance to change. So I want you to just log that definition in the, in the back of your mind. I want you to, to say, okay, I'm just going to store that there because we're going to come back to that uh, two or three times over the course of this narrative, and we're going to find a way to apply that to, to our lives. But before we do that, let me begin the story. And our story today begins with a guy named Joseph Caiaphas. Joseph Caiaphas. And if you look in your Bible, you'll see him listed mostly as just Caiaphas. Now, who was this guy? This guy was the Jewish high priest. 
between the years of 18 and 36. So this is a, so it wasn't between the age of 18 and 36. This is AD dating. And so this is Jesus' time. And so the year 18 to the year 36, Caiaphas was the high priest, the Jewish high priest. So what, what does that mean? All right, so essentially, this was the most important, most influential man that there was for the Jewish people, for the entire Jewish nation. Caiaphas was, was at the top of the food chain. See, they had the temple in Jerusalem. Now, this temple represented everything that had to do. It was the, the epicenter for the Jewish religion. I mean, it, everything started in the temple. Everything came from the temple. And Caiaphas, as the high priest, he is in charge of the temple. He's at the top of the food chain. And in fact, he kind of had a bit of a dynasty because his whole family, he had five brother-in-laws that were also high priests. He had, um, uh, his father before him was a high priest. And so here you have this man that kind of comes out of like a, a mafia type situation or a clan type situation where their family has this history of being in charge of the temple. So what does it mean for Caiaphas to be in charge of the temple? And this is important for us to know and for us to understand in our story because we're going to see Caiaphas go through some resistance and go through some tension. But if you don't really understand what it was that he was resisting or why he was resisting, then th this doesn't make any sense. So Caiaphas, as, as the head of the Jewish temple, means that he was the go-between between, between uh, the Jewish people and Rome. So at this time, you had Israel, who is, who is living, and the Romans are actually in charge of everything. And the Romans, they were kind of like, okay, you guys can be yourselves. Jewish people, you can worship your God, you can do your thing, as long as you don't kind of disrupt things, or as long as you don't threaten the, the Roman agenda. But you guys can have your own courts, you can have your own laws, you guys can be, you can operate as you want to operate. And so there had to be a go-between between the temple and the Jewish people and Rome to kind of make sure that that relationship was working well. And that go-between was, was Caiaphas. So not only is he one of the most important people for the Jewish uh, religion, he was also one of the most important people as far as how the Jews interacted with the Romans. Now Caiaphas also was really important because he had at his disposal, this thing called the temple tax. Now, this is kind of like the VAT system, you know, that you guys are used to or that we're all used to here. But anyone that went to the temple to do anything had to pay a temple tax. So you walked into the temple and you paid a tax for being there, a tax for your sacrifice, a tax for whatever it is that you were doing. Now, this was such a lucrative thing that it would be the equivalent of like having millions of rands going through the temple. I mean, it was a massive amount of money. In fact, it was so much money going through the temple in this temple tax that all the other uh, outlying Roman provinces would look at the amount of money leaving their country or leaving their area and going into the Jewish temple, and they would say, wait a minute, this isn't right. This is so much money. Would it not better serve us, the Romans, to keep this money in our province? I mean, it was a massive, massive amount of money. We, we know that here, if you've ever tried to order shoes or anything from America and have it brought here, South Africa wants to make sure that they get that money. And that's the same with any international kind of exchange or currency. So this whole thing started even all the way back here. It's making, they wanted to make sure that this money stayed where it should stay. So Caiaphas happens to be one of the most powerful, influential, wealthy people in the entire Jewish nation. And he plays the most important role in preserving the Jewish tradition and the freedom of the Jews to practice their religion and in, in doing that in partnership with the Romans. So this guy's pretty important. This guy's got a lot on his plate. The, the, this guy is, is single-handedly kind of trying to be the one that preserves this wonderful life that the Jews have created and this great temple system. So when you have un unlimited access to wealth and to power and to, um, and to authority or to influence, that, that, that gives you something that maybe you want to hold on to. That's something that Caiaphas wanted to not give up. And so this is where we're going to see Caiaphas kind of resist a little bit. But it's important for you to understand who he was. 
See, in the Bible, he's more like a footnote. He, he gets a couple lines and a couple scriptures. And he gets maybe a footnote and a small explanation, but that's it. But we need to understand the context of how important this guy actually was. And so his life is going pretty well. The temple is working. The tax is working. Everything is cruising along pretty smooth until all of a sudden this young man comes along, this guy named Jesus. And Jesus, he becomes, uh, he kind of announces himself as a rabbi in the year 30 to 33. So Caiaphas is the high priest during the time of Jesus. He's the high priest during the time of Jesus going to the cross. So Caiaphas has got everything perfect. Everything is working. Everything's working as it should. Jesus comes along and he disrupts it. He, he disrupts the whole model. He turns it on its head and all of a sudden now Caiaphas starts to feel this tension because this thing that he was working so hard to protect and so hard to maintain, now this single person, this single guy, calling himself a rabbi, is threatening the entire thing. I, I find it pretty interesting to think that you have this giant machine, which was the Jewish people and the temple. I mean, it was so big that even the Romans kind of respected it and allowed it to operate. And the whole thing can be threatened by one man. I mean, that, that to me is a, is a little bit wild. But there's a reason why it was threatened. In fact, Jesus, he was a triple threat. So there's three things that Jesus did that, that made Caiaphas kind of squirm in his skin. In fact, made all of the Jewish leaders squirm. So Jesus was a threat on three fronts. And the first front, which is one of the most important, was the size of the crowd. So the size of the crowd that Jesus drew. So if you've ever, you know, as we talk about the Easter story, you know, Jesus was persecuted. He was eventually, you know, put on the cross. But why? Why were they so upset with him? Why did they want to get rid of Jesus? Why did they want to remove him from the potential uh, power that he was wielding and the, the, and the, the momentum that he was gaining? Why? You know, it's something that maybe we don't ask ourselves that often. So here's exactly why. See, the Jews did not care what Jesus taught. Jesus could have taught any religion that he wanted to. He could have gone and created a weird cult that worshipped sand. It didn't matter. Jesus could have done anything, and they would have not cared. The only reason, one of the only reasons that they cared was because Jesus drew a crowd. Everywhere he went, there was a crowd. And it grew, and it grew, and it grew. And you know what happened when a crowd grew? It gained more attention. Now, why is attention a bad thing? Well, because if a crowd is growing and it's getting more attention, then maybe the Romans would start to see that there is this crowd and there is this momentum that's growing and gaining. And now all of a sudden, Caiaphas is starting to wonder, is this crowd going to grow to the point where the Romans are going to see that there's some momentum gaining here and then therefore everything that we're working for and standing for is going to be dismantled? See, that, that's why they were so afraid of Jesus. And you know what? Before you judge Caiaphas, before you sit here and say, well, come on, man, you need to get with it. Obviously, Jesus is the way and Jesus is right. I want you to put yourself in Caiaphas' shoes. You know, you, you, you have not only the wealth and the prosperity and the authority that you're trying to protect, but you have hundreds of thousands of years of, of culture and, and people and religion that you're trying to kind of carry on your shoulders and protect. And one guy comes along and there's a potential that he upends that. Well, that, that's hard to swallow. And so because of the crowd, Caiaphas sees Jesus as a huge threat. Now the second reason that Jesus became a threat was because of the authority that he spoke with. So Jesus spoke, not only, it, it, it's hard to put it into words, but so there's a story in, uh, in the Bible where Jesus goes into the temple. This is the same temple that Caiaphas and his, that, that we're talking about. This is the temple. Jesus walks in. And he sees that there's money exchange and there's things going on in the temple that should not be happening. So what, what was going on is not only was there the temple tax, 
But there was also, uh, you know, kind of other things happening, maybe some bribes, maybe prices were being raised on doves and things that people would need to buy for sacrifices. So people were skimming a little bit off the top, and it was becoming, hey, it was a pretty good business. And so Jesus sees this, and he gets upset, and he actually turns all the tables over. Now, I love this because I'm a little bit of a loose cannon, and I have a hard time sometimes, you know, keeping my mouth closed. And I've been in a few meetings where people next to me, whether it be my wife or one of our elders, has put their hand on my leg and said, hey, stop. You know, you need to cool it down a little bit. But Jesus, Jesus, I, I love that he shows us that Christians don't have to just be pushovers. And I'm not saying that you need to go out on the streets and in the name of Jesus, you know, beat people up or say, hey, you're not going to push me over anymore because we need to love. Yes, we need to love people. We need to do all of that stuff. But I love that Jesus gave us the permission that in the name of, of what he was trying to do for others, for in the name of love, he kind of gives us permission to speak with authority and to act in, in authority in his name. And he does that. So he goes into the temple and he flips all the tables over. I, I love that. And what happens is the temple guards, they come and they, they don't say to him, what is it that you think you're doing? Instead, they say to him, who is it do you think that you are? So they're, they're recognizing on what authority are you flipping these tables over and stirring the pot here? So Jesus had an authority with him, an authority that was recognized by everybody. Now, the third thing, and this is, this is a big thing, this will really kind of sour a relationship, is Jesus had this habit of being extremely critical of religious leaders. So obviously people don't love it when you, know, you tell them how they're not doing good at their job or how they're ruining a religion or major things like that. You know, people don't really like that. Some people can't handle criticism at all in any way. And here Jesus was, he was extremely, extremely openly critical of the religious leaders of that day. And in fact, well, I've got a verse for you here in Matthew, Matthew 23, this whole chapter if you go and you read this chapter, you'll see that this entire chapter is Jesus basically just dogging the religious leaders of the time. And it ends here on verse 33. This is Jesus talking to the religious leaders. So he says, you snakes, you brood of vipers, how will you escape being condemned to hell? So put this in perspective for you. Jesus walks up to the people that are in charge of the spiritual well-being of an entire nation. They are at the top of the food chain as far as being holy is concerned. They are the, the, the temple chief. They are the chief priests because they are the ones that are held to the most holy of holy standards. Jesus walks up to that person and he says, you are condemned to hell. Now they knew what hell was because they, they knew the Old Testament. They had the majority of it memorized. They knew everything about all of this stuff. So when Jesus walks in and he calls them a snake, it's like he's, re it's, it's like he's referencing Satan in the Garden of Eden where he was turned into a snake. And now Jesus is like, hey, you're a snake. You're a brood of vipers. Like an, I mean, this is aggressive talk. And then him telling them, you are condemned to hell. You cannot even escape that. I mean, that's just, if you imagine that scene of Jesus looking right at the leaders and telling them, you're going to go to hell. I mean, that's a, that's a critical spirit. That's Jesus being extremely critical of the religious leaders. So now you have these three things about Jesus that makes the, the, the Jewish leaders feel really threatened by him. And hopefully you can kind of understand that if you're, if you're a Jewish leader, if you're Caiaphas, and a, a man walks up, and he starts doing these three things here, you would, you would feel a bit stressed. You would feel a bit uh, tense. And so the story continues, and the, and the story goes on, and life kind of continues a little bit, but something would happen that would become the final straw for Jesus. Now, it wasn't something that Jesus said. It wasn't a conversation that he had or a, a confrontation that he had. It was an act of compassion. It wasn't something that, that, that Jesus um, said, it was something that he did. See, Jesus 
was going to do something that was going to finally push Caiaphas and the religious leaders over the edge. Something that they, they, they could no longer look away. They could no longer continue with the strategy that they had. In fact, what was happening, uh, if you read the Bible and you wonder, why are the Pharisees always questioning Jesus? Why are they always asking him, Hey Jesus, what's the greatest commandment? Hey Jesus, what would you do in this situation? Hey Jesus, I want to challenge you on how you feel about this, or what does the Bible say about this and that? I mean, he was constantly being challenged by the Pharisees. And they were smart. It wasn't just that they were trying to make Jesus look bad. I mean, they were. But the goal was that they were trying to divide the crowd. See, if they could, and we have this happen to us all the time, especially with Twitter and social media, you know, you, someone can spark a question out there. And all of a sudden, you can take a group of people that at one point were united, and you can now divide them. This, one of the best people at doing this is actually the church. You throw one controversial issue, and all of a sudden, a church that stands together just goes, Burnk, it just splits. You know, hey church, what do you think about transgender? All of a sudden, split. It just takes one thing. And so the Pharisees were trying to do that. They were saying, hey Jesus, what do you think about this? What do you think about that? Because they knew that if they could divide the crowd, then they could kind of disintegrate what Jesus was doing. They could take away his momentum. And so that was their strategy. But that strategy was about to change. Because Jesus was about to do something that would force them to change that strategy. And what Jesus does is he, he raises a man from the dead named Lazarus. Now, a lot of us know the story of Lazarus, but if you don't, Lazarus was a very prominent, famous person from the city of Bethany. And Lazarus died, and Jesus got word that Lazarus was sick, but he didn't show up. And Lazarus died when Jesus got to Lazarus. And not only was he dead, but he'd been dead for three days. So what that means is that Lazarus' body was wrapped. It means that he was prepared. So these guys, when they died, you know, the body, it, it smells. It decomposes. It turns to liquids. I want you to really get the visual there. Everybody take a deep breath and think about that. Now, so, so it, wasn't, it wasn't like a magical thing where Lazarus died and he laid pristine on a, on a bed with a, a white sheet over him. No, the, the dude was completely prepared for burial. He was wrapped. He was scented so that he wouldn't smell bad. He was put in the tomb, meaning people had been poking and prodding and wrapping him for days. And now Lazarus is in the tomb. He's been there. Now, I mean, he's D-E-D dead, completely dead. Jesus walks in, and Jesus says, Okay, Lazarus, come out of the tomb. Jesus raises him from the dead. Lazarus walks out. It's one thing to, to think about the miracle of Lazarus being raised from the dead, but also logistically, how did Lazarus unwrap himself? How did he get to where he could walk? You know, it's like the miracles of Jesus. Actually, you can see in all these like interesting little ways. But Lazarus was raised from the dead, and when this happened... The crowds, they just grew like crazy. And then the crowds grew, and they grew, and they grew, and they grew. And now Jesus had this crazy amount of momentum. He had an unbelievable amount of momentum. And I'll tell you why this momentum was extra scary. And Jesus even kind of recognized this himself. See, a lot of people thought that Jesus was going to be the Messiah... And what that meant was that Jesus would lead the Jewish people to freedom from Rome. And so in a way, even the people that followed Jesus thought that Jesus represented an uprising from Rome. And so Jesus, a couple times in his ministry, actually pulled himself away. And he went away from the crowd because he did not want the crowd to elevate him to that position. So both good people and bad people are assuming that Jesus is going to disrupt what's happening between the Jews and the Romans. And so let's look at the scripture here. I want to unfold this narrative for you. And I know that I've been calling this a, a, a story, but I just want you to know that this is found in John 12, 17 through 19. We have this information because John was there. We have the information because John went and he did the research. He researched with Luke. He researched with the other disciples. And they wrote this stuff down. This is documented truth. This is real information. 
And so in verse 17, now, this is after Lazarus has been raised. Now the crowd that was with him when he called Lazarus from the tomb and raised him from the dead continued to spread the word. So the crowd is just, they're freaking out. They're telling everybody that they know. And then in verse 18, many people. So this thing is building, it's building, it's building. Many people, because they had heard that he had performed this sign, they went out to meet him. So Jesus is now, because of what he's done, this is the final nail in the coffin. It's the final straw, and the crowds explode. So this is the triple threat that Jesus was now becomes unmanageable. And because it becomes unmanageable, there's a response from the Jewish leaders. And in the next verse we have, So the Pharisees, so these are the, the Jewish leaders of the time, they said to one another, See, this is getting us nowhere. Look how the whole world has gone after him. So their strategy was not working. Their strategy was broken. This strategy of we're going to divide Jesus and divide the crowd, it's not working. So the whole world was turning to this man named Jesus. So let me just jump back quickly to the beginning. when We talked about that word resistance. Can you see how people, the Jewish leaders, were starting to worry? And they were resisting. They were super stressed. Because they were refusing to accept or comply with the destiny of humanity. Jesus and his purpose was working itself out whether they were doing it or agreeing with it or not. And I want you to almost feel the tension of what it would be like to be Caiaphas and his group and have everything that you know, everything that you've stood for, start to unroot itself and you are fighting to hold on to it. You are absolutely just resisting and that's where they are so after the pharisees have this meeting joshua put the next verse up there for us so then the chief priests and the pharisees called a meeting of the sanhedrin now what this was like just to give you some perspective it would be if the da and the anc and the eff all got together and had a meeting and agreed with each other so that's how absurd this meeting was because there were different theologies here and and all kinds of stuff they got together and in this meeting, we go to the next verse. They say, what are we accomplishing, they asked. Here is this man performing many signs. I want you to imagine them sitting around a table. And they're like, this is, we're not getting it done. We're resisting, but it's not working. So they ask, here is this man performing many signs. If we let him go on like this, if we continue this strategy, if we let Jesus continue to build momentum, everyone, everyone will believe in him and then. See, after and then, we are going to have revealed to us the reason why they resisted so much. And so, let's reveal it. The next verse. And then the Romans will come and take away both our temple and our nation. That's the resistance. Because they know that they could potentially lose everything. And so they're resisting. If we let Jesus continue, then we're going to lose everything that we've ever had. And in fact, I would like to imagine that somebody would ask this question here. They would say, if we do not do something, then we are going to lose something that's very important to us. Now, I want you all to think about this statement. Because you've all said it, and you've all thought it. If I don't do something then I'm going to lose something that's very important to me. So just put that in your back pocket. Now, Caiaphas comes back into the story. And Caiaphas is over it. He's done with it. He's had it. He takes control of the meeting, and he says, this is done. I'm going to put an end to this. And so we look in John 11, and Caiaphas, he says this. He's, then one of them, named Caiaphas, who was the high priest that year, spoke up. You know nothing at all. I like to imagine, because I've been watching the Avengers and all of those movies, that Caiaphas is like uh, Thanos or a big villain, and he slams his wrist or his fists on the table, and he says, you, you know nothing at all. You do not realize that it is better for you that one man die for the people than that the whole nation perish? So Caiaphas is saying, we're going to lose the entire nation of Israel. We're going to lose the entire thing. We're going to stop messing around with Jesus. We're going to stop messing around with the crowd and trying to divide the crowd. And we're going to end this guy's life. We're going to end it. 
And so Caiaphas goes on. He's got a bit of an issue because the Romans would not let, they would not put someone to death that was uh, someone that was guilty of violating a Jewish law. So Caiaphas knows that Jesus has to be shown that he is violating something that the Romans stand for. And so Caiaphas manipulates this situation. He presents Jesus to the Romans, to Pilate, in a way that says, he says that he's king of the Jews. Now look at all the momentum he's carrying. Look at, look at all the people that are surrounding him. Look at how disruptive this one man has been. Do you know that he even raised somebody from the dead? Imagine what he's going to do to the Roman Empire if all these people follow him. And with that, Rome decreed, okay, Jesus would be put on the cross and Jesus would be crucified. And so now Jesus is crucified and he's dead. Now Caiaphas... He's got the Jesus dilemma solved. Jesus is crucified and dead. And so Caiaphas has preserved that which was, he was so afraid to let go, right? Caiaphas has been able to preserve everything. So Jesus is gone. The dilemma is over. The problems are solved. Uh, the Jewish nation is protected. Israel has been protected. And so Caiaphas, he did it. Good job. You win, right? But it doesn't exactly work out that way in the end. See, in the end, if we look even further into the future, Caiaphas would end up losing his position in the temple, and then the entire temple would end up falling. So it's like everything that Caiaphas is working to preserve, it, it ends up disintegrating anyway. But this is where, where I want to just take a hard turn from the story. And now I want to talk about you. I want to talk about your life and your heart. And I want to talk about you as far as resistance is concerned. And I want to ask you this question. At some point, did you have an option to choose Jesus? But instead, you said no because there was a cost that you were not willing to pay. At some point, did you have an option to choose Jesus? But you said no because there was a cost that you were not willing to pay. You know, so many people, all of us, we are given an opportunity to choose Jesus. It may come from an invite from a friend. It may come from uh, an alpha course that you take. It may come from a church service that you found yourself sitting in. It may come from uh, a family member encouraging you. Or you know what? It may come in a night where you've, you were laying in bed and you were thinking about your life and the existence of it. And you just had this little thought in your mind about this guy, Jesus, and about God. And you kind of know and, and you know enough to know that this guy is supposed to love you and he's supposed to have given his life for you. And you're given an opportunity, an opportunity to accept Jesus to make a commitment to Jesus, but you don't. And I want you to know that, that we've all been there. I can think back to many situations where I laid in bed at night before I gave my life to Jesus, and I felt the nudge of the Holy Spirit. I felt Jesus calling to me and saying, Chris, I love you. Chris, I just want you to choose me. Chris, I choose you. All you have to do is choose me. The, his choice is already made. And I, I just, I couldn't do it. There was a, there was a cost. And for me, I was afraid that people would think that I was silly or people would think that I, was, uh, that I would not fit in at school. And to, so to me, the cost was, if, if, I, if, if I do this, I could potentially lose my status and my friends at school, and that's not a price that I'm willing to pay. So ask yourself, what, what are you trying, what is it that, that is going to cost you? Following Jesus is going to cost you something. Following Jesus is going to, it's going to cost you. So what is it that's keeping you from following Jesus? What is it that's keeping you from, even if you've given your life to Jesus, what's keeping you from continuing to follow Jesus? And I want you to understand that whatever that thing is, and if that's you in that position, it's okay. I want you to understand through Caiaphas' story that Caiaphas, I don't think Caiaphas is a bad guy. I think he was lost. I think he was wrapped up in a lot of money and a lot of power and a lot of wealth. But also, Caiaphas only knew one way of life, and that was, the, that was his Jewish tradition. 
You only know one way of how you do life based on your culture or based on the family that you're raised in. You only know how relationships operate in one way because every relationship you've had has left you hurt or broken. You only know how to be married in one way because that's all that you saw your family or your parents before you do. You only know how to act at work or you only know how to interact with your boss because you've been conditioned to act that way. I mean, your life has led you to this place and everything that you know about your life, everything that you consider yourself, everything that you stand for is a part of what has shaped you to get you to that point. Now, Jesus is a disruptor. He is a disruptor and disrupting things stops the progress that you're on and it helps you change directions. So a a story about that, Benjamin yesterday was having a complete meltdown, complete freak out. And everyone in our house was exhausted and everyone was tired and I was trying to help and I was trying to help with Benjamin and he was just, he was hitting and he was yelling and he wouldn't calm down and so I picked him up and I took him into the bathroom in the bathtub and I turned the cold water on and I dunked him in cold water. (laughs) Uh, and, And as he's screaming, I'm thinking... Child Protective Services is going to come and they're going to take this child away because he was just screaming, just bloody murder. But you know what? Once that cold water penetrated his hot, sticky skin, he started to calm down. I had to disrupt and change the, the firing of his brain in order for him to listen. Jesus is the best disruptor that you'll ever have in your entire life. But he will come in and he will absolutely disrupt everything that you stand for. Because he wants you to choose him. But we, we want to resist. We want to fight for what it is that we feel like is ours. Now, I, I've got one more statement and then I'm almost done. But I, I want to bring this up. And I want to talk about regrets. Because we resist... And then when we look back on life, maybe we have a regret. And I found this statement really, really uh, thought-provoking to me. And it's, your greatest regret is connected to your attempt to preserve something that you had no business preserving. And it's not even part of your life anymore. Your greatest regret is connected to something that you were trying to preserve. And it's not even part of your life anymore. So many of us, when we look back on our lives, we say, I regret that relationship. I regret that business decision. I regret that affair. I regret that, that purchase. And when you look at your life now, is that even still there? The purchase is gone. The relationship is gone. The affair, that didn't pan out. Those things didn't work. You know what? We, it's crazy because we fight and we resist so much for something that we feel like we need and we need to hold on to. And then when you retrospectively look back on it, you say, actually, that was a huge regret. And if you start to trace all your regrets in life and you start to actually think about those, okay, let me list out the last five things that I regret. Could it potentially be that you were resisting something that Jesus was trying to do in your life or you were resisting some kind of change in your life and you just refused to give in to it and so instead you held your course and you didn't let Jesus be the disruptor in your life and now you've got this whole list of regrets? Well, the last thing I want to ask you guys to do is I want you to consider today maybe letting that go and letting Jesus disrupt your life. I, I, want, to, I want you to, to ask yourself the question of what am I resisting? What... What, what am I resisting? What are you resisting? See, this, I'll, I'll get very real with you. I care about one thing and one thing only. That's why Sundays are my favorite day. That's why this is my favorite time. That's why even with a baby on the way, if I can do one thing with the church, I'm going to be here on Sunday morning. I care about one thing and one thing only. I care that everyone that walks through those doors, wherever you've come from, When you walk through the doors of our church and you sit in here, you're presented with an opportunity to let God encounter your life and for you to let yourself be encountered by God. And I don't want you to continue resisting something that you could just let Jesus disrupt and you could let go of, and then you could just live in the freedom that comes with Christ rather than the prison of trying to maintain something that you don't even need to maintain anymore anyway. So whether that's a relationship, a financial status, or whatever it is. My prayer for you today is that this has inspired you to think about something that you're resisting. 
and how that may be tied to a regret and see that Jesus just wants to disrupt that and for you to let it go. So I hope as I close this in prayer, I hope that God speaks to every single one of you and that you have the opportunity to do something to bring you freedom. So let's pray. Lord, I pray over this room and I pray over everyone that can.